up here and if you were here for church yesterday, we need all the help you can get. <laughs> yes. Please. It gets a little high. <laughs> and Terry being the other high voice. Yes. Yeah. So anyway. All right. Go for it. it for, for Sabbath, actually. She was worthy, worthy. <laughs> I tried to get her to come up and sing, and she wouldn't do it. So, Okay, this one we definitely need some help with, okay? I only sing on the Alleluia, so you're actually going to be helping me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you were saying, please help me. Okay. I thought you were saying it's a good thing she only sings on the Alleluia.
breath or hot air, whichever it is, <laughs> that allows you to reach those notes and hold it out. <laughs> I just say it. I sure hope they don't turn this microphone on by accident. <laughs> <laughs> I can't sing. Woo, everybody go, what was that? <laughs> um, no, um, I just love what God has called me to do. I love it. I love it. I, have, I think I said that I have a, um, an office in Rio Rancho that I get, I get to help people all the time. What a blessing it is. And um, I put my card over here on the table, a stack of cards if anyone just wants to call and talk to me, whatever. <laughs> I do also have the capability of doing counseling sessions long distance. If you, if you can hook up to Skype or Google whatever, hang out and stuff like that, we can do that. So that helps some. <laughs> so it has my phone number and my email address on that. But 
you know, um, through the years, it, it's just, it's a very, most of the time, it's a very rewarding ministry that God has called me to. I've seen just the most fascinating things happen in my office. You know, one time back in Iowa, a, a lady called me and said that, um, could she bring her son? Because I, I like to, I love teenagers. <laughs> I do teenagers, adults, I don't care what age, who cares? The Word of God affects everyone, right? <laughs> Can transform anyone. But this lady in particular came this time and she brought her son and she, he was 16 and she was just like, I just, I just, I don't know, just fix him. That's usually what they say, <laughs> just fix him. <laughs> and so um, she, she came in first and talked about him and said that, um, that it was very serious. It was to the point that they thought that perhaps he was trying to hire a hitman to take him out. I know it's pretty, sometimes it gets really serious in there. <laughs> so I asked her, do you want to come to the counseling too, you and your husband? And we can do all three of us. Oh, no, no, it's just him. Fix him. <laughs> and so every week she would bring him and leave him, and then she would go out to the car and and uh, he and I were having counseling sessions for a while and and he was the sweetest. <laughs> he really was a sweet kid. We became really good friends. And then after about the fourth time, I think he would go home and tell her what I was teaching. And then she came in one day and she was kinda hanging out and I said, Do you want to stay this time? Yeah, I'll just sit back over there and okay. So, but she didn't, she sat up close and I have usually two whiteboards set up in my office and drawing stuff and stuff. And they were sitting there and, and that day I got about halfway through it and all of a sudden she just burst into tears and just was bawling. And he looked at her like, Mom, <laughs> she just, just, and I, I knew what was going on, you know, that it was hitting her. And, and he just kept going, Mom, are you okay? Are you okay? And she pointed to the whiteboard and then she looked at him and she said, that's what you've been trying to tell me, isn't it? And he said, yes. And they just hugged and, <laughs> yay God. <laughs> Another time there was a, a man who was a real high up executive in one of the big firms in Iowa way up here, he's the director, and he called me and he said, can you work with my 15-year-old daughter? And I said, yeah, but you and your wife come and let's all three get together and, and talk. And, and so he told me the problem was that she had a boyfriend, she, it was a problem, she had a boyfriend that uh, the dad didn't like, <laughs> and it was a problem because the girl was trying to break up because the dad said, break up with him. But he was then telling her, if you break up with me, I'm going to commit suicide. And this poor girl was just, oh, you know, so pulled. And, and so the dad sat there for an hour in, in my office just tell me. And he, uh, as a big time high up executive, he was very bold and controlling. And, and you tell her this, and you tell her she's going to do this. And I was just... And then after about an hour of that, I said, okay, I'm going to take her and we're just going to go talk for a minute in the other room. And so we went over there and I said, now tell me your side. And, and she did. And we went back in the room and, and I taught what I'm about to talk about right here. <laughs> and boy, I could tell the, the girl was sitting like where you are and the dad was sitting further back so I could see her face but he couldn't see it see her face the whole time he would talk she just had to roll her eyes but as, as I taught this she just softened and she got it I, I, it was written all over her body language she got it and I knew the boyfriend was gone. <laughs> he, he was toast. <laughs> and so at the end of it, I said, okay. Well, and the dad goes, 
Well, that was a very nice presentation, but you didn't tell her this and you didn't tell her that. And I said, I didn't have to tell her that. I said, she got it. She, I said, if you could see your daughter's face, she got it. And about a week later, I got a phone call from the mom and she said, yep, that's all it took. The boyfriend's gone. She's on to another boyfriend. <laughs> that wasn't the problem. It was just the problem. But I, um, it's, when I get to go places and, and talk like this, I'm so in love with Jesus <laughs> that I just want to talk about him the whole time and get, get into the word and just dig and dig and dig. And, and more like last night, more word and, reading scriptures and then sometimes I have to do more of the counseling <laughs> which I, I love doing that too but sometimes then it's it's sometimes it's both of the you know I mean even though I, I do teach Bible based counseling don't get me wrong but you know I just love to just talk about the word all the time but so what I'm going to talk about now is more uh, counseling <laughs> But this is what God told me to do when I came, so I have to do it. And this week I was really going, oh, God, can you, you know, praying about what to do. And I was like, oh. and I was thinking of all the things more like last night, just the word, the word, the word, the word. He's going, oh, I really want you to do that. And I'm like, ah. And then he reminded me of this um, scriptures in Matthew 22, 36. And it says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, cam on these two commandments hangs all the law and the prophets. And he said, I didn't say there's only one commandment. Love me. Love each other. And love yourself. There's three relationships in that. Your relationship with God, your primary, most ultimate relationship, your relationship with others, and your relationship with yourself. And we're really needing more teaching about how to relate with each other and our spouses and everyone. <laughs> I think, and he said, I, on those two commandments, and it's very important that we learn how to love our neighbors and love ourselves. In the part on these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. He said, it's just as important for you to go and teach that. So I said, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> so I'm gonna pull the whiteboard up and I don't know if everyone can see it if you need to move. I don't know, because I have to write kind of small in some of it. I probably should do a PowerPoint can everyone see it maybe? <laughs> All right. <laughs> this one um, I learned from Henry Cloud. I don't know if you guys know who Henry Cloud is. Absolutely love Henry Cloud. <laughs> you read all of his books. He's just, he is awesome. Yeah. Um, this one I learned years and years ago from him. I went to one of his conferences. And and he, I think he taught this at one of his conferences. But, um, you know, when an architect's going to build a building, he needs to know what kind of building it is. Because it depends on whether it's going to be like a huge skyscraper or a big hotel, or if it's going to be a house, or if it's going to be something like a little outhouse. <laughs> because you're probably not going to put quite the same steel in the outhouse that you would in one of the... <laughs> I was teaching this in Iowa one time in a John Deere engineer, the senior, uh, he had won the senior engineer of the, of the year award for the whole region in Iowa and Illinois. And he was there and, and I said that. He goes, well, I would build it with the same structure. And I said, well, you don't count. <laughs> so, mm. Depending on what type of building it is determines the kind of structure needed because the, the structure is what holds it together and gives it its, its, its firm foundation. When I lived in Houston and I was going to University of Houston, 
we drive downtown to through all that traffic all the time. I was watching this huge building, huge, I think it's the largest building outside of a downtown area in the world at that time. It was huge and I uh, watched it go up as I would drive to classes. And um, they, they finished it in a big celebration. All the tenants moved into it. And then, I don't know, it wasn't very long after that, I was driving to school again, and I heard that on the radio they said that they were, I think they were making everyone evacuate the building because um, they said it was unstable. And they said that what happened was they had put the wrong size screw in the building in some parts of it, and they had to go in and re replace it. So. One little size of the screw, yeah. So it's difficult. You need the structure right. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they learned that. The structure holds the building together, and it's the skeleton of the building. But people have structures too, and I draw the structure of people like a like a triangle. And that engineer that night, when I drew the triangle and told him that, said, actually, Tracy, that is the perfect design in the engineering world for a level. <laughs> like, oh my. <laughs> some people have very godly structures and some have very ungodly structures. And only Jesus has the perfect structure. Your values are the skeleton of your life, the structure of your life. They shape your reality. And your values determine the path your life is going to take. So like this person's structure, their values may take them down this path. And this person's structure, their values may take them down that path. And God desires our path to be that life cycle that he ordained for us, but we have a free will. To be holy, your values must be two things, well-defined and consistently lived out. Both well-defined and consistent must be present. When you have very well-defined and consistent values, you live a very well-defined, structured life well-defined without consistency is not valuable to you. It must be well-defined and consistently lived out. Say this person values, uh, I don't know, this person values honesty. Well, if this person doesn't value honesty, they value dishonesty. This person values uh, being sexually moral. And this person values sexual immorality. Maybe this person values drugs. Maybe this person no drugs. And you can tell that they probably live, if they are well-defined and consistently lived out, the paths their lives would take would be very different. If you consistently live out your values, you won't have the same scenario if you don't, as if you don't. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. And if you consistently live out your values, you probably won't have the same friends as otherwise. And if someone comes into your life and they don't have the greatest structure, and if you want that person to stay in your life more than you want to live out your values, you won't take the same path as you usually did, as you would otherwise if you said no to that person, like that interruption thing a minute ago. How did these values get into your structure? There's different ways. One way is that you're born with them. Because of the fall, all of us have selfishness in us. Um, also, one way of things that are born is your temperance. 
some people, as you can tell by our singers up here. <laughs> One is rather bold. <laughs> oh, look at her. <laughs> I have been called many things, but never bold. Bold. That's a <laughs> I wish I had just that much of your boldness. <laughs> But you know what? I was born the way I am, and you're born the way you are, and it all works. Like this. No? No. Uh uh. It was very shy. <gasps> oh, yeah. And then one day, for you. one day, I went on a camping trip with Jody and the shyness. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's all you need is a camping trip. Yeah, no. Where's Jody? Where's Jody? <laughs> Jody, can I go on a camping trip with you? <laughs> I'll win the Drury, or you will, and we can go together to the Drury. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh. Well. I don't know. structure besides being born that way they can also be internalized in you internalized <laughs> well, Rick, get, get it back. <laughs> okay they can be internalized in you from different ways and um, one is like by your parents from your parents it's one of the greatest ways and um, like um, like dental hygiene. This person may uh, value dental hygiene. How does that get? Oh my, no dental hygiene. <laughs> How does that get in them? Like I remember my little, uh, my, my firstborn, when she first got her first little tooth, I bought her a little toothbrush and I stood her up on the table. Nicole, this is a toothbrush. Look at her brush teeth and taught her how. I, then every day after that, brush, brush, brush. Because in my structure, I value dental hygiene. And so they, if you do that in through time, you know, you teach them and every day, well-defined, consistently lived out, then they say that definitely by the time they're nine years old, as they go and lay down, they, and they didn't brush their teeth, they hear mama going, in their mind, going, did you brush your teeth? <laughs> <laughs> they have the choice to get up and let it be in their structure or not be in their structure. Um, things like your ABCs, you hear it over and over and over. Your ABCs get into your structure and become well-defined and um, consistently lived out. And if you don't believe things like that are not your values, what if someone came up to you and said, Darla? count to 20 for me and you started counting and you counted it correctly and then they go oh no there's no 14 in there you go you value that yeah <laughs> no that's internalized in me it's a value and yeah so just that's one way your parents are doing things over and over and over <laughs> family holidays that becomes a value your t family traditions your parenting skills, how you learn about your, I call it a marriage package you get in your head by watching your parents. And they say that a little child, I remember reading one book about this internalization, um, that little children learn so much from their mothers. Like, and they watch just, not even the words she speaks, but her facial expressions and things. In an example I'll never forget, they said this mother was uh, coming in the house and carrying all these groceries and had her little children around. 
As she walked in the kitchen, and the refrigerator, something had gone wrong, and a big puddle of water down there. And she goes, oh, no, oh, through the groceries, and what are we going to do? Oh, your dad's going to come home. He's going to kill me, like it was her fault, you know. <laughs> what are we going to do? This is so horrible. I just don't know what to do. And the little children, they're standing there watching mom do that. Well, they're getting internalized in them how you handle problems like that. If, even if it's something that is not your fault, you have to freak out and this is how you handle it. Compared to the mom that would walk in and just, oh, something must be wrong with the refrigerator. I need to call a repairman. Well, I'll do that in a minute and calmly putting away her groceries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it, I think that's interesting. Also, one thing that you can get in your structure internalized is like how you handle conflict resolution, your conflict resolution skills, things like anger, all kinds of things. Um, other ways things get internalized into your structure are from your friends, from television, from movies, from books, and definitely the television, now, I mean your telephone now. But your pastor's trying to, when they get up and speak, they're trying to internalize things in you. Other things that can internalize is um, experiences and traumas that can definitely internalize things. <laughs> um, Holy Spirit is working to internalize values in your structure. In Isaiah 48, 17, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. It really is um, important to have Holy Spirit in your structure. Some people have Holy Spirit and some people know Holy Spirit. This poor person that has this structure. <laughs> Get a bad rat over here. <laughs> Also included in our structures, our values are like your work ethic, your integrity, your goal setting skills, depression. I know I have a large percentage, I would say at least 80% of my clients are suicidal, mm -hmm. and at least. And some of them, some of them have attempted it several times. And I've even had clients call me and say, I just, you know, took something, and it's a cry, and I'll go out and find them, and I'll drag them to the hospital. <laughs> I did that one night in, in Iowa in a real dark cornfield. <laughs> I was a little scared walking up to the car, car that night because she was in it, and I couldn't see her. And, but anyway, I'm sorry, I got off on that rabbit trail. <laughs> but what, what I learned just through my experience with most of the people, they learned like her. I learned this from her. Uh, most of the people in her family, they valued suicide as a way out of their uh, out of their problems. They had learned that it had been internalized in them. That's how Mama and Grandmother and they attempted it, and they go in, you know, to the hospital, and and she had passed it on down to her sons, and I was just like, ah, oh, that got internalized. Also, besides the things that are internalized in you, like the ABCs and things, there are also voids, in, can be voids in your structure of things that maybe God wanted the wisdom, like we were talking about in, a minute ago in the life cycle. In each segment, you need the wisdom to walk it out, but maybe you don't have that wisdom. And there are voids in your structure of wisdom of how to walk things out. So things get internalized, and then a lot of time, everyone has voids in their structure of things that wisdom that would really need to be in there. A lot of times, um, you may be, um, Maria may be up teaching sometime in church, and she will talk about maybe forgiveness as the topic of her sermon. Have you ever heard of peeling the onion? <coughs> Where Holy Spirit will, as Marie is talking, Holy Spirit's nudging you. You know, you have that unforgiveness in your structure, and you value that pretty much. 
as Marie is up there talking, trying to get forgiveness internalized into you, Holy Spirit is, you know, working on you seeing that little thing in your structure we need to work on. And he'll do that. He will take one thing at a time like that and point it out to you and say, we need to work on this. And that's called peeling the onion. Usually he doesn't go, you've got so much in your structure. <laughs> by tomorrow I want it all gone. <laughs> He's peeling the onion, taking layer by layer of the things in your structure and trying to put wisdom in there. Um, if, most, if you have healthy conflict resolution skills internalized, into your structure and they're well defined and consistently lived out, then the people that you are in relationship with, this will be the way like Holy Spirit does. Can we talk about this one thing in your structure that's impacting my life? But most people don't have healthy <laughs> conflict resolution skills. And so what happens, and usually it's, it's pretty bad by the time they come to my office, um, this is how I draw it. This is one of my favorite part of the whole teaching. And, it, and you're going to go, what in the world is that? Because I'm not an artist. Give me a second. This is my favorite part of it. <laughs> Do you know what that is? It's a bomb. <laughs> I love it. A what? A dabble. Yeah, well, I'll work on my... My, my drawing skills. Here's another bomb. Not an apple, a bomb. <laughs> but what, what people will do instead of having healthy conflict resolution skills and talking, can we, you know, doing it right, can we talk about this one thing? They'll just throw a bomb. <coughs> in Nothing you do is right. Everything you do is wrong. And it just blows up their, just trying to blow up their heart. Well, guess what? You do everything, you know, just, I mean, just throwing bombs at each other. It's, and it's horrible. It's horrible to see it. And then they do it in my office. I'm like, please don't do that. <laughs> no, I don't. I'll let them do it if they want. <laughs> but it's really sad because they, it's really important to learn healthy conflict resolution skills so you don't do that. Because if you do that, usually the marriage, you can't survive that. And it's so sad. So these are, all these things, values, are in a person's structure. And guess what? You, a lot of the things, like I said with that uh, life cycle, each step of the way, God is wanting wisdom imparted into you so you can walk out each step prosperously. If you, like Jesus said, Matthew 27, listen to my teachings, get them internalized, walk them out. But a lot of times um, we're left with a lot of boys, or we have the wrong things, unhealthy things, internalized into our structure. And usually they're well defined and consistently lived out, right? <laughs> Healthy or not. <laughs> but the thing is that growth can happen. These things in our structure can be removed. And um, there's a lot of things that they're learning now about our brains and how our brains function and how they're how they're wired through experiences from our parents and how habits are formed and stuff. And, and it's just, it's learning these things and getting them in your structure by them being internalized into you. There are actually um, electronic paths in your brain that are formed and they actually can form grooves in your brain. It's, it's deep, it's deep stuff. You can be rewired. <laughs> you don't go and, you know, stick your finger in the electric socket or anything. You have to find the right people that will, will help you and, and learn the wisdom and, and try the new ways of doing things. But growth can happen. The things that you had internalized in your structure, they can be removed. The void, void areas, you can get new, things, new growth and new wisdom put into your scripture, uh, into your scripture, into yeah. your mind. I'm, I'm just realizing I have a whole page missing in my notes, but that's okay. Okay, so.
So what happens with these things? Oh, I know what it is. Hold on. Let me look because I don't, I don't want to forget anything. Um, yeah, the whole page is missing. Okay, so what happens is I'm going to draw this and then I'll explain it in, in an example. But demands of reality... These things that are all in your structure, they're called your inner equipment. This is this person's inner equipment. All their values and things are internalized in them. This is this person's inner equipment. So demands of reality will hit your structure. You process it with your inner equipment, and you produce fruit. Same thing with this person. Demands of reality hit this person's structure. They process it with their inner equipment. They produce fruit in their life. Here's an example. Um, we all have lots of needs, like the need to eat. <laughs> Yeah, hunger. <laughs> so say this person in their structure um, has healthy eating habits in their structure. And they, it's well defined, consistently lived out. This person has unhealthy eating habits in their structure, well defined and consistently lived out. So if I walk into an office and these two people are sitting there and I have two dozen donuts, and I walk up to the first person and I say, would you like some donuts? That's a demand of reality hitting their structure. They're going to process it with their inner equipment, which has healthy eating habits, well-defined and consistently lived out. And they're going to go, no, thank you. And it's going to produce fruit in their life of not having all those calories and what happens to a person when they take it. <laughs> So I walk over to the next desk and I go, would you like these two dozen donuts? <laughs> That's a demand of reality hitting this person's structure. Processes it with their inner equipment and produces fruit. I actually was teaching this in a conference one time <laughs> and a good friend of mine had brought all these donuts. <laughs> and they were sitting on a side table. <laughs> oh. He was eating the, sitting there eating the donuts. So he threw that, really, Tracy? Really? <laughs> oh, I still laugh at that. That was the funniest moment. The thing is, though, that the fruit that your life produces doesn't just hit your structure. It hits the structure of everyone around you. Just like if you had a spouse that has uh, adultery in their structure. I can guarantee it not only hits their life, it hits your life too. <coughs> yeah. um, I know that there was, the, have you ever seen the television show The Biggest Loser? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't watch television, but one I was walking through and I saw it on television and it was this little girl and her dad and they were interviewing and I guess they were, uh, this was years ago. I don't know how they do it. I don't even know if this show's still on television. Is it? Well, the little girl was saying at this time, she was saying, um, please take my dad on your show because I want him to go outside and I want him to play and play with me and play soccer and he never goes to any of my games and I just want him to go see he had unhealthy eating habits he just had not never learned about exercising how to eat healthy and so it had produced fruit in his life but not only was it hitting his life it was hitting his daughter's life too and I think that they did take him onto the show and so they were trying to internalize in him healthy eating habits and, and exercise so that it would affect his life and her life and I'm sure there was a lot of other good stuff on that page that I can't find anymore. <laughs> Let me think for a minute to see what... No, I think that's about it. If you look at Psalms 101, 
it's a, I love this because King David seemed to understand about structure. I don't know if he had a whiteboard, but he understood about structure. In Psalms 101, it's written by David, and starting in verse 2, he says, I contemplate the way of perfect innocence. To contemplate isn't just to kind of think about it and go, oh well, whatever. It's to sit and think about it. He wanted the path of his life to be perfect innocence. He says, I contemplate the way of perfect innocence. Oh, well, when will you come to me? I walk constantly with innocence of heart within my house. Can you imagine being able to say, I walk constantly with innocence of heart within my house? <laughs> no, I need to so King David understood how things got internalized into his structure and other people's structure. And he starts talking about who, what kind of people, the kind of structure they had to have before he would allow them to be in his house. Not just to be the people closest to him, but even his very servants. And he starts lift, listing off in verse 4 the kind of structure a person has to have to even be a servant in the house. And he's saying if they have this in their structure, they can't even be in they can't even be around me. He says, A perverted heart shall not no, a perverted heart shall remain removed from me. I shall not know evil. He's saying I won't put any evil thing before my eyes because he knew it would get internalized into his structure and become his inner equipment, and he would produce fruit. I love that. I shall not know evil. He who slanders his neighbor in secret, him will I cut down. One with haughty eyes and an expansive heart, him I cannot bear. My eyes are upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks the way of perfect innocence, he shall serve me. That's a pretty strict demand of it who to be your servants. <laughs> they have to walk the way of perfect innocence. In the midst of my house shall not dwell a protect, protect, practitioner of deceit. One who tells lies shall not be established before my eyes. If they have lying in their structure, can't even be in my house. Every morning I will cut down all the wicked of the land to excise from the city of God all doers of evil. I just think it's really important that we understand the people that are we are um, trying to walk with on that life cycle. You need the right people in your life. People who have the right things internalized in them so they can pour it into you if you have those voids. Or read books, get books on the subject. Listen to Maria. <laughs> Sweet Maria. <laughs> you guys are blessed with very special pastors. But you know, we have to have to understand that there's people around who didn't have parents that have a lot of wisdom to get it internalized into them and have grace on them. I, I, like that engineer that was there and said, no, I would build the structure of my <laughs> outhouse with steel frames. I watched him for years after he learned this. He would find, uh, he was in men's ministry, and men would come to him and talk to him about the problems they were having in life. And I would watch him sit down. And he'd just grab a napkin or he'd grab whatever's around him and start teaching them about st structure and explain to them, do you see the things that are in your life that are your inner equipment and they're well-defined and consistently lived out and they, they're the reasons you're producing this fruit. But you can get new things internalized in you. And to repent, you know, doesn't mean you keep it in your structure like unforgiveness and when a demand hits you, you process it and you keep producing the fruit and you produce it and go to God and say, 
sorry God. It's recognizing the fruit is taking you down a path and you're producing fruit that is not holy before God. And it's actually getting rid of that out of your structure. Where it's no longer a part of your inner equipment. It's gone. I recognize that it's unholy before you, God. I don't want that to be in my structure. And lots of times, like I said, that the um, family traditions and holidays that husband and wife, when they first get married, well, this is how we do Christmas. Well, this is how we do Christmas. <laughs> you know, you have to learn to understand that that was truly internalized in that person, and those really are values. And you have to use good conflict resolution skills to try to work out things a lot of times with people like that. It may not be really bad things in their structure, it's just not what you value. And I was hoping and planning to do conflict resolution skills, but we don't have time. <laughs> I talked about other things this morning instead. Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to be like King David who says he walks constantly with the innocent heart within his house. I cannot imagine being able to say that what kind of a structure he had to have. But I, I guess the only thing that really matters is saying, God, I want to walk out that path that you have for me that I can glorify you the way you created me to glorify you. Because if you, I can testify, if you've heard my story, <laughs> the things that were in my structure, I just didn't have the right equipment in there to handle that segment of life I was walking through. And it almost took me down. And I spent 19 years trying to build this structure where I can make it through. And I think we're going to have to really keep working in the end time to get the right things built into our structure so we can walk it out victorious the way God wants us to in the end time. And we can do it. We can do it. I think my time is over. And I can't tell you what a blessing it's been to be here with you guys. Amazing, amazing women. If you'd like to call me, just take a card. Thank you. Can I pray for you? Before? God, thank you for this time together. I know you've been with us, and I pray that you've been glorified. I pray, Father, that you will graciously point out to each one of us the things that are in our structure that are causing us to produce fruit that you would rather us not have in our life. I ask you, Lord, to help us to recognize the people that we're walking with on this adventurous journey with you who maybe not have the greatest structure and they're drawing us out into interruptions off the path, not just people but things. Pray that you will do what you do best, talking to us about it, illuminating that to us so that we can see and we can repent and we can walk in holiness before you. You are such a holy God. We love you so much. And I pray that you will guide each one of us, grant us the wisdom we need to walk out each segment of our life we can stay, our feet stay on that path that you have ordained for each of our lives. I pray that you will bless these women. Bless Maria and Bobby. Thank you for this time. May you be honored in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.